If people are asked to come back to work, but they're not comfortable taking the tea, and David's already established that that's a pretty big number of people uh, based on the uh, Suffolk poll, what steps can we take to get ready for many more cars on the road? Bob, is that mm. just going back to the old normal? That's what, uh, that's what people are afraid of. And uh, as you can see from the photo behind me, it's happening. Um, these cars were at least not stopped. Apparently they were moving, but uh, getting to that point, once again, people say that the biggest reason they like telecommuting is not having to do their usual commute, which for many people was a soul deadening one to two hours a day, which took a lot out of their lives. And that's why I think telecommuting is going to be a more attractive option for people. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. Welcome to this evening's forum, The New Normal, Coronavirus Polling and Policy Considerations. This evening, we are pleased to welcome prominent pollster, David Peleologos, Director of the Suffolk University Political Research Center. I'd like to note that for the 2020 election cycle, Nate Silver's statistical model on pollster accuracy on 538.com has Suffolk University ranked with a grade of A, and the Political Research Center is ranked seventh in the country out of a total of 430 polling organizations, and is ranked number three when rating organizations with more than 75 polls. This evening, Dave will share polling data on public sentiment from his recent surveys conducted in Massachusetts and across the country. We will learn from David and our other experts how Bay Staters and Americans in general are handling the pandemic and what they think our new normal might look like. We'll discuss the political implications of the pandemic as well as the big hurdles in our shared recovery from voting, to concert going, to riding the tea. Thanks to all of the evening's participants who will shortly be introduced. Well, thank you, Susan. It's great to see, it's great to be working with you again, and greetings to everyone joining us for this important conversation tonight. You're about to get a real insider's view, as Susan said, from one of the best pollsters in the business and some of the top journalists in Boston covering what we're calling the new normal, coronavirus polling and policy considerations. Now joining me in today's forum, as Susan mentioned, David Paleologos, the director of the Suffolk University Political Research Center, where his cutting edge survey research has gained a lot of attention nationally and internationally. And congratulations, David, on 538. We're also joined today by Bob C., who is WGBH Radio's transportation reporter. And before me, hosted Morning Edition. Bob also hails from Rhode Island Public Radio and had a storied career in radio on Cape Cod, so he knows a thing or two about waiting in traffic. WGBH's Soraya Wintersmith is with us. She covers the Boston neighborhoods of Dorchester, Mattapan, Roxbury, spends a good part of her time reporting on politics. Soraya and I spent a good chunk of time together on the trail in New Hampshire. She was a statehouse reporter in Richmond, Virginia for many years before this. We'll also talk later with Rachel Cobb, the chair of political science and legal studies at Suffolk University. Rachel's one of the top political analysts in the country, specializing in elections and civic engagement, both of which, of course, are being challenged as we speak. And I'm going to guess that has something to do with the great number of participants we have with us tonight. So welcome. Let's get started with David. He's gonna walk you through some of the important polling results, including a survey that we partnered with David to create at WGBH News to give us the backdrop of our talk tonight. David, take it away. Great, thank you. Thank you to WGBH. Thank you to the Ford Hall Forum, all of the members of the Suffolk family and just people who are consumers of polling information. It's great to, it's great to be doing this. Uh, let's get right into it. We're gonna reference a number of polls um, and a couple of the polls that we're going to reference are uh, the Massachusetts polls that we did, uh, as Joe had mentioned. Uh, one is the, uh, the, the March poll, which was the first coronavirus poll in Massachusetts. The second is the national poll. Um, and so this gives, this gives you a little bit of, uh, of, of, of an idea of the kinds of um, things that we think about for, for students of polling 
you want to remember that the polls we did in Massachusetts were residents, the polls we did nationally were voters. There's a little bit of a difference. And those of you familiar with polling know that a residence poll tends to include more young people, more minorities, more disabled, uh, more regular people. Unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of them aren't registered. So a likely voter or a voter poll shows a slightly different demographic. But in this first graph, I wanted you to see how two Republican leaders are viewed so differently by Massachusetts residents. On the left, you've got a before and after of Governor Baker's approval. 80 plus percent for a Republican. Now remember, there are only 11 percent registered Republicans in Massachusetts. So for a Republican governor to be plus 80 percent approval on the treatment of coronavirus is an amazing statistic. You contrast that with President Bush, Republican at the national level, and you see a vastly different story. One in four are giving him a job approval, which is slightly less than what President Trump got in 2016. President Trump in 2016 got one out of every three Massachusetts voters, about a third of the, of the, uh, of the total vote, and his job performance is even worse dealing with coronavirus. A question that we asked in Massachusetts, are you able to get the information you need from the following? And so we were trying to figure out how respondents will, look, when you think about your town, your city, your selectman, your mayor versus Governor Baker at the state level and the state, uh, the state administrators who are overseeing uh, COVID-19 and then at the federal level, this is kind of a reinforcing statistic that shows how weak, comparatively speaking, the federal government is vis-a-vis -vis local and state uh, 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 government in providing information. And the next slide is government involvement. So there has been a lot of discussion in the news and you've got to kind of take this with a grain of salt. Is there too much? Is there too little government involvement? So here you have two questions that we asked on the national poll. Now these are like, these are voters about government participation. So the black, uh, the, 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 the first graph, the black graph, are people who say that that there's too much government in terms of solving the pandemic on, a, on the health problem side and on the economic fallout side. The second chart is people who say too little. And the third, the gray bar shows that people are saying that's about the right amount. What this chart tells us is that people in this, at this time want more government involvement on multiple levels, on the health uh, problem situation and in terms of economic fallout. And very few people are saying that government is too involved in this. The effects of income. So in Massachusetts, when we first did this poll in March, only 36% said that the coronavirus had diminished a people's regular income. That wasn't so bad. Um, it's still bad. It's, it's you know one in three, a little bit more than one in three. But in May, we noticed a significant increase, 10% from 36% to 46%. And I would imagine that if we were in the field today or in a couple of weeks, that number would be higher. And you see in the red box, just a little notation, that people who are ages 18 to 34 years of age in Massachusetts, they went from 34% in March to 52% in May. So what that tells us is that young people are taking the economic hit the most in this scenario and young people to protect those more vulnerable, those older are suffering the most by having their own uh, incomes diminished because of the coronavirus situation in Massachusetts. We asked a lot of activities in the last poll, in the May poll, and I was glad WGBH uh, expanded on this question and pushed us to really dig deep in terms of what kinds of things people would be comfortable doing if they were allowed. So think about right now, if, if we said to you, Governor Baker said, the state says that it's okay to do X, and we had a bunch of different activities, these are listed in descending order. So the most common is uh, seeing a family person. Yes is 72%, that, that would be normal. Uh, shopping, 71%. So that means that if today, 
you are allowed to do these activities, would you do them? But look at the bottom of this list. Riding public transportation, even if it were allowed by the Commonwealth, only 18% would ride the T, less than one in five. Attending sporting events right above the bottom one, only 23%, we're a big sports city. Uh, one in four people, if allowed, would attend a sporting event. And you can go up the list from there, again, going to the theater, movies, concerts. So in the first step of this question, there's a lot of pushback in terms of people being comfortable. The second, uh, the next slide is the same exact activities if there were a treatment, but not a vaccine. And you see the numbers come up. Shop, uh, seeing a family person, 85%, shopping goes up to 83%. Go all the way down to the bottom. Even if there were treatment, only 41% would ride public transportation, less than half would attend a sporting event. And finally, in the next slide, we have the question about, would you be comfortable if there were a vaccine? Now, I thought going into this question, it would be near 100%. You'd have a vaccine. What would be holding you back from doing these activities? And as expected, many of the activities we listed were in the 90% range. But I'll go back down to that bottom of the list. You still have one in four respondents in Massachusetts saying that even if there were a vaccine, they would not ride public transportation. Even if there were a vaccine, they would not attend a sporting event. Again, it's a big economic driver in Massachusetts. Sports, we have many championship teams. Uh, and so we'll get into, we have other speakers. We're going to talk a little bit about this and recreation activities. But I thought that was interesting to note. What uh, And again, here's just a graph that shows the difference between, I pick, just picked those three things, shopping, attending a sporting event, riding public transportation. You can see how different they are. Next slide. Mail-in voting. Rachel's got some great um, anecdotes to share with you and some data to share with you. But in our Massachusetts poll, 74% of people say that, now look at the wording in this question, by the way. Would you support conducting all voting by mail? That's a tightly worded question. The reason we asked that, it, it, because it was, it was really a superlative question. And we didn't expect, I certainly didn't expect that three quarters of respondents were going to say an all mail-in voting election in Massachusetts. When you look at this, the demographics are very powerful. You see Republicans are the only demographic that, that don't support this. I think the breakdown was 84% of Democrats, 82% of independents in mass, and 14% of Republicans supported mail-in voting. Do you support or oppose these alternatives? Now, this is from the national poll, and I wanted Rachel to have this info for her presentation. Again, in, uh, in, this was likely, uh, this was voters, the national poll, mail-in voting, two-thirds, absentee voting, three-fourths, early in-person voting, three-fourths. And look at this, online voting almost, almost beat out the oppose, even, you know, with online voting and all of the issues that we've had with hacking and the 2016 election and the, the uh, you know, the, the follies potentially of online voting. Um, a big, a big number here in that national poll. A test of endurance. Yeah, I just wanted you to see how steadfast and strong your fellow Massachusetts, if you're living in Massachusetts watching this, how steadfast and strong the Massachusetts community is. 41% uh, said that they could hunker down for three weeks or less, 31% uh, in May, so it dropped a little bit. And look at the the uh, the purple the, the the purple box 57 and 66 percent for those who were saying months or indefinitely that they could hunker down. Uh, when do you think things will get back to normal? This is an amazing number. Again, only 27 percent said less than six months, and the lion's share 38, almost 70 percent are saying six months, all the way up to two plus years, and some people even said never. David, thank you. We just went through a lot and learned a lot there. And boy, how about those numbers, like David pointed out, on not just transportation, but sporting events in this town. So let's get into some of what we just learned. In our first panel, we're going to look at public sentiment toward riding public transit. That number especially, and all the stories tied to it. Joining us to talk about that is WGBH Radio's transportation correspondent, Bob C., 
And it's good to see you, Bob. You look like you're stuff in, stuck in traffic, so stay well, right where you are. Okay. And I just want to let people know this photo is from yesterday morning, not uh, six months ago. That in itself is news. I thought you were bringing us back to a day no. that uh, we fondly or not so fondly remember is stuck in traffic. No. Right. So it's coming back. That's incredible. Boston's seven, not open, I thought. 7 a.m. Right. Where are they all going? Anyway. So considering the high percentage of people who say they're just not going to return to the T, Bob, is it possible for this MBTA, for this agency, to build enough confidence to make people feel safe, come back and change that number? Well, uh, they're certainly hoping so, but they realize they have a big challenge. Uh, I heard Stephanie Pollack say today that three out of four rush hour users of the T said they were not going to return. So that's a huge percentage of people. Uh, but what the T faces are, are basically uh, challenges regarding crowded vehicles, whether it be subways or buses, how to avoid overcrowding. And this is going to be a real challenge as they try to determine what six foot spacing means aboard vehicles. The other issue is masks and the inability of them to actually enforce the uh, wearing of masks. They can say they require it, but there's no way to really enforce it. And there are exceptions for people with medical conditions. And because they can't ask people about their medical conditions, uh, that's sort of a catch-22. Uh, the other issue is disinfecting the vehicles, which they do frequently, but people said that they wanted to have more hand sanitizer available that they could use to protect themselves. But the trick is, um, how are they going to ramp up service enough so that they provide enough subway cars and buses to avoid overcrowding? So they're going to be running a uh, normal schedule, actually, starting phase two, the earliest being June 8th. They said today that they were going to run the red, blue, and orange lines at full schedule. Uh, the buses uh, will be more than full schedule, actually. They're going to be selected routes where additional buses will be deployed. And commuter rail will be about 80% of its usual volume. Even though they may have very few riders, the only way that they can convince people to get aboard these uh, cars and trains is that there's enough room for them safely. So that's a real challenge. And they have to let people know, especially the messaging has to be very strong about what they are doing to encourage people to return. So the consequences, potentially, if we don't come back, are on display behind you. Here, Bob. Right. That means we're all taking our car. And you and I, before this pandemic ever started, spent a lot of time talking about and reporting on uh, some of the worst traffic congestion in the world and an MBTA that was going broke. So then what? Well, this is the fear that without people taking uh, public transportation, they're going to end up on the Southeast Expressway again. and. Stephanie Pollack uh, said today that she believed that commuter parking uh, may be a thing of the past as people decide that they're not going to take the train, that they're going to drive their cars into town and take advantage of what are very empty parking garages right now. So that may be the immediate future. And that uh, to try to uh, change that in any way means it, it basically convincing people that taking public transit will be the best uh, option for them. Yeah. But it's, it's a big challenge. You know, there's also uh, this, this thought that I hear come up a lot, Bob. I don't know how realistic it is. Uh, people say, gosh, you know, with this big lull in traffic, uh, my goodness, uh, we should start fixing the T. Uh, I don't know if that's something, David, you can weigh in on, but um, that was the biggest story in the Boston area before this all started was fixing the T for the long term. And here we are with maybe the best opportunity we'll ever have. Well, well they, are, they are taking advantage, right, David? I mean, they are doing the blue line work, which uh, is a major undertaking, two weeks of uh, shutdown of the blue line. And the question is, can they get the personnel and the materials to do it quickly enough? They are definitely trying to do it. And I think the blue line work came literally out of the blue. It wasn't in the plans at all. We have yeah. green line work this summer, which will mean month-long shutdowns in July and August on certain branches. But the blue line work is significant because they have this old leaky tunnel, which is going to be very difficult to fix, and they need this time to do it. So I think they are taking advantage as much as they can. You wonder, David, should they start installing plexiglass on the Z cars? Will that bring people back? Well, I mean, it's a short-term problem, but it's also a long-term problem. You know, Congress is looking at an infrastructure bill 
uh, potentially of the House is looking at passing something this year, maybe even before the November election. And, you, you know, uh, as, as Bob knows, I mean, these, it takes decades to, to, to adequately plan transportation infrastructure. And so no one knows whether or not these shifts are going to be a bleep uh, and whether people will return to it. You know, we have no idea whether or not this COVID will, will, will rebound and so on. So, you know, it's really a challenge for those people who are in charge of, of not only managing the day-to-day -day operations and transportation, but also the long-term planning. If you're just joining us, thanks for being with us here on The New Normal as we bring you uh, an important conversation in partnership with Suffolk University, the Fort Hall Forum, and WGBH News. As David uh, was just mentioning here, uh, we have a lot of concerns about public transportation, and it's something that Bob C. Uh, reports on every day at WGBH. How about taking this lull, Bob, and I'd love to hear you weigh on weigh in on this too, David, to make streets safer for pedestrians, for cyclists. Those are also big issues here. Well, today, the uh, Mayor Walsh's office announced the beginning of what he is calling the Healthy Streets Program. And that's going to involve uh, setting aside parking lanes and sections of streets to expand bus stops at 10 key locations. He's also going to uh, institute several bike lanes easy, called quick build bike lanes, I guess pop-up bike lanes along many streets. And uh, he also is arranging to uh, try to provide restaurants with outdoor seating on streets that might be temporarily closed to allow that kind of uh, distancing that they would need. Uh, this is the beginning of a program, the first phase. Some advocates had hoped that they might see more, uh, including more closed streets, but that's not in this proposal, nor does it address a lot of neighborhoods outside of downtown Boston, Alston, Brighton, Dorchester, Roxbury. Those areas are not really included in this. So this is the beginning of a transformation that I think you're going to see in Somerville. You've seen some of it in Brookline. There's been a call for it in Cambridge. But I think what you mentioned, well, can they do it quickly enough before the traffic returns is the question. And when the traffic does return, can they maintain what they have built? This is going to be a real challenge, but there's a definite desire for people to have a more livable, walkable city. Well, I wonder if there's some balance here with everything uh, that we've heard from Bob and David. Fewer people take the tea. More people are driving as a result, yet more people than ever are telecommuting. Is there the potential for some balance in this actually working out? I'd love to hear from both of you. David? Yeah, I, th I think so. I, you know, but it would take a coordinated effort with the chambers of commerce, the leaders both locally and at the state level to coordinate uh, exactly what you're talking about. You know, mm -hmm. are people who are over 55, 50, 60 years of age going to be disproportionately uh, telecommuting? Uh, is that going to free up? I mean, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, what we talked about in the last segment about safety. You know, anytime that you try to quickly reroute people and close off streets, it the potential for accidents goes up. People aren't used to which streets are closed. You've got drivers who aren't paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I worry about the, those are the externalities that we can't really measure right now, depending on what the specific plans are asking for. But I think that, you know, ultimately we're going to need a coordinated effort. It can't be just a one size fits all a political decision. It's got to be an approval of all the major, um, the, the major employers in the state, as well as local leaders. You know, it's, it's interesting, before the pandemic, Boston's telecommuting rate was about 4%, <laughs> which was well below the national average of more than 6%. Uh, now it's about uh, 50 to 60, up to 70% of people telecommuting. Governor Baker and Stephanie Pollack are both kind of pleading with employers, can you keep your workers at home as long as possible? Yeah. The workers are somewhat divided uh, over whether they want to stay there or not, but many of them would prefer to, say, work from home two to three days a week and maybe come to the office one or two days a week. But this is a, you know, a two-way tango, so the employer has to agree as well and be convinced that they're getting the kind of productivity that they would otherwise get with the worker physically there. So there's a great testing period that's going to take place. Mm -hmm. I predict that you will definitely have more telecommuting that this is going to be here to stay as people get more comfortable with it. There's a lot more telemedicine, by the way, going on these days than there used to be as well. And that once people see the efficiency of this, as 
kind of retail, you know, compared to brick and mortar stores and retail, when you begin to see, gee, I don't have to do a one to two to three hour commute every day in order to do my job, people are really going to prefer that. And I know some companies like Facebook, I believe, are actually using it as a perk to attract employees to say, hey, you can work from home. So this is something we're going to see more of. And as far as Governor Baker and Stephanie Pollack are concerned, this is a, a great relief to them because it gives them the time that they need to work out some of these problems in terms of getting people back on public transit and doing it in an orderly and safe fashion. Well, it really gives you a sense uh, of how little we know and how, <laughs> no. how much has yet to be determined. We're, we're experimenting uh, in real time here. And so we will ask uh, uh, the crowd here, we'll ask our participants in what will be uh, the first of several poll questions that we're going to ask you in real time and have David weigh in on. Very simply, what is your comfort level with reopening? How did you arrive at this one, David, and what are you looking for? Well, this is, it's just important for, for, for people to be thinking about it, not only just sport. I mean, I'm a, I'm a season ticket holder, and we're going you know, we're gonna, to we're gonna hear further about recreation activities for the Boston Bruins. And, you know, I'm in that age category, which was even lower, uh, the 55 to 64 years of age, which was even lower than that 18% and 23% number that you saw. So, you know, that age group, uh, that's the age group that's still active. They're taking their grandchildren and their nieces and nephews to games. And if you're a sports owner in town and you're losing that demographic, it was 55 to 64 year olds and African-Americans who are much lower in terms of uh, riding the T, attending a sporting event. So, the, you know, it'll be interesting to see how our, how our uh, respondents uh, deal with these questions. Well, that's for sure. This is a live poll. We'd love for you to weigh in right now. It should pop up uh, right in front of you while we're talking and we'll get a sense of how you're feeling uh, about reopening and getting back to some level uh, of the new normal, as we're calling this production. You mentioned a really great point, uh, David. That is the potential uh, physical danger when you start changing the, uh, the way streets look. You put uh, dining in the middle of the road on Newbury Street, and maybe somebody hasn't come into the city for a long time, or whatever number of things could happen. There'll be a big public safety component here. Absolutely. You know, and you, you think about it, you know, you know, are, are people going to be want to be, you know, eating outdoors with a flow of traffic, not a car traffic, obviously, but just people walking by. Oh, I hear. Okay, so uh, we've got we've got some results in. How about that? Well, it looks like we're ready to go shopping, David. What are you seeing there? <laughs> well, we have a lot of pent up shoppers. <laughs> Ninety seven percent are ready to go shopping. The, the rest, maybe not so much. And this kind of mirrors what the poll says, which is and, and amazing that attending a sporting event is actually less than riding public transportation. The exact same percentage riding public transportation, 18%. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then even with the vaccine, it almost exactly mirrors the, the, uh, the you know, the poll that we had. Um, that's terrific. That's exciting. Isn't this fun? This is super <laughs> cool. See, we can't be together in, a, in an historic theater, but we can do some pretty neat things with technology. Uh, like you said, Bob, uh, this is the technology that we've had this whole time. We just haven't been using it quite so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being forced to use it is giving people a whole new experience. That's, that's, the, like. that's the truth. WGBH Radio's Bob C. It's great to see you. We never get to see each other in person. Maybe that's the other benefit here. I saw more of you today than usual. Uh, stay out of traffic, uh, Bob, and, and thanks for being part of this. And listen for Bob's reports. Uh, on the air on WGBH Radio and WGBHnews.org. As we turn to our next topic here, in the new normal. And that is public sentiment towards recreational activities. We're kind of taking a little bit of a wrinkle from what we were talking about there with, with sporting activities. On this day that we learned the Boston Marathon is canceled, not postponed. It's not going to happen this year other than Kind of a different version they've come up with uh, in the virtual world, but we'll have plenty to discuss right now about this with WGBH Radio's Soraya Wintersmith. Soraya, this is only the latest major cancellation that uh, we've actually seen so far in Boston. I'm thinking of not only the St. Patrick's Day Parade, which is a, you know a big rite of uh, the season, but the NAACP conference. That was a major win for the Walsh administration to bring that here. It was, Joe. We are seeing lots of people just taking a better safe than 
sorry or even dead as I'm talking to people in uh, interviews and just conversations. Better safe than dead wow. is the attitude that I'm hearing. Yeah. And uh, when WGBH broke the story about the NAACP convention being postponed, which we later learned will be virtual, it came about because people were concerned about what was going to happen. There was no word about the convention, which was expected to draw thousands of people from everywhere. There was no word about what was happening with it. And we actually got our hands on a letter from a concerned Bostonian who addressed his uh, a letter to the national president of the NAACP and said, hey, you're going to bring people here with their germs and you're going to harm Bostonians and you need to make an announcement about this. Hmm. So that's how that came about. And yeah, you're right. We learned today that the 124th running of the marathon is not going to happen, which I think is amazing uh, when I think about what the CEO of the Boston, Boston Athletic Association said today. It's just that it's been happening since the 1890s. And even in the midst of World War I, they repurposed the event as a relay and that happened. And in 2013, with the tragic bombing incident that occurred as people were still on the course, in the aftermath of that, the event still happens. And so this will be the first time that the Boston um, Marathon, as we know it, is, is not going to happen. I've seen reports from the Boston Business Journal that suggest that's millions of positive economic impact that's not going to happen for the city. Uh, even still, the governor said that it was the right thing to do. Um, and he approved of the city and the Boston Athletic Association making that decision today. That Unreal. When you consider the ancillary business, uh, David, that Soraya is talking about, the, the tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars in lost business from these events, just a few we've mentioned, and there are others, including opening day that didn't happen at Fenway Park and, and so many other places. Uh, it, it does make you wonder what the overall economic impact is here. But as we consider uh, the Biogen Conference, you remember this, uh, David, which was one of the major vectors in spreading the coronavirus. That too happened here in Boston, and we can't afford another one of those. Absolutely not. You know, and, 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 and I mentioned sports team owners before, you know, but it's all of the other businesses. I mean, think about Fenway Park. Think about the pubs and the restaurants and all of the activity, you know, sports memorabilia. Uh, you know, businesses that that, uh, that that sell anything that's sports related, all of those businesses are being impacted now because, you know, I still have my old hats from three years ago. I haven't bought any new apparel and I can't go to a game and, and I'm dying to to be, you know, I'm a big sports consumer like, like, like a lot of other people. Yeah. Um, those are very big economic drivers. When we released this poll, it really jolted me. I, you could almost feel the anxiety of the respondents in the numbers on those cross tabs because people are so concerned about not only their health, but the political future at the federal level. And, you know, when, when we think about the decisions that have to be made administratively here, it's mind boggling. It's absolutely mind boggling. And, and it may be that we have a longer recovery in Massachusetts than in other states. We're all, we always seem to be the economic uh, you know, engine. We're always ahead of the, the nation when it comes to our economy because we seem to be so resilient. But this poll is suggesting that may not, it may not happen that way. That's for sure. Uh, so enter the age of digital socializing, Soraya. Uh, I'll try not to get too personal here, but uh, people are trying to adapt for, when it comes to everything from seeing your family to dating. Uh, to just filling up the day. I have no news to report on the dating. All right. Nothing, nothing to tell you there. I will tell just you. Put the feelers out. <laughs> I will tell you that I celebrated a birthday recently and I actually canceled a trip to go and wow. see my mother and my sisters down south. But, but they surprised me with a party on an app. My mom made a cake and found some <laughs> candles and. We had a party. And I think that this is one of the major ways that recreation is changed uh, under the conditions of this pandemic. I'm sure yeah. both you and David have gone to some virtual happy hours. <laughs> yeah, and not, not to mention the people driving by honking their horns. Uh, does that happen in your neighborhood, David? Every, every time a, a child has a birthday, there's a parade. 
and a shout out to all the grads. You know, my, my son, Angelo, is a high school grad and mm -hmm. he, you know, they're going to have kind of a makeshift graduation uh, ceremony. And he has to deal with no senior prom, no senior week. You know, all of those activities are, are kind of out the door. And you, you think about that, the kind of stress that, you know, that, 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 that impacts these students in terms yeah. of not having what we had. What else is the city and, the, and for that matter, the state uh, government doing, Soraya, in terms of making our parks available to people or kind of managing spaces that allow people to get outside without getting in trouble? This sounds super nerdy, but I think that this is probably one of the biggest implications about recreation is how people are looking at parks. The National Recreation and Parks Association has a little bit of polling data that suggests lots of people are now considering their park essential for their mental and their physical health because you can't go anywhere else. There's nothing else available. And to that end, the commissioner of the Boston Parks and Recreation Department uh, told me recently that they're looking at different ways that they can have socially distanced safe events because they know that people are going to be looking for their parks. So I've heard everything from perhaps drive-in events where venues can accommodate a drive-in maybe chalk circles, like what we saw in um, San Francisco, I think, where people did the six foot circle and you know that you're safe if you're hanging out. Um, our playgrounds have been closed uh, for quite some time, even though if you live near a park like I do, then you know that there's, it's really hard to enforce and there's still people playing around in the parks, but That's true. we're looking at ways to make it more open for people. Well, before we bring you to our next poll uh, question, and we'll ask all of our participants to get involved once again on this, uh, you know, it's it's one conversation to have Soraya, but gosh, you know, we're missing baseball and we're missing uh, cruises on the Charles or eating lobster rolls at a restaurant or whatever it might be. A lot of people uh, don't have an option. There, There's no fun when you're out of work, when mm -hmm. you've got a bunch of kids out of school in your house. Mm -hmm. when you're not mobile, uh, and it creates a whole host of new personal health challenges. Right, right. This is another reason that parks will be big. It's free and affordable fun for everybody, um, especially for folks that perhaps aren't making as much money as they have been. Absolutely. It's interesting to hear the drive-ins are having their day, apparently. I don't know if you used to go to drive-ins, David, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. There's something kind of fun and retro about it. We can at least stay in our cars and watch a movie, right? I'm a big drive-in fan. Bring them back. <laughs> You're here. I'll meet you at the Kowloon. Uh, so how about our poll question? They're putting one up there, supposedly. How about our poll question? Uh, has the pandemic impacted your income? Uh, that's a big one. Its impact on you. Has it diminished your regular income? And this speaks directly, David, to a, a, one of the poll questions you had at the beginning of our program. Yeah, you know, in that first poll, like I said, 36%, and then, and then in the most recent, 46%, an increase of 10%. We really don't know if that trajectory is flattened, if it's going down, or if people are, uh, you know, are, are being hit worse as time goes on. Um, so, you know, this will be kind of a, a fun indicator before we go back out on the field with our, with our next poll. Yeah. We learned today uh, unemployment claims, another 2 million uh, federally, tens of thousands more here in Massachusetts. It's been incredible, David, uh, when we look at the dichotomy between Main Street and Wall Street. 40 million people are out of work right now, but Wall Street is in rally mode these days because investors seem to think we've got this imminent recovery. Yeah, it's a big bet. You know, uh, the stock market is six to nine months ahead of the economy. so. Uh, that tells us that at the beginning of next year, we're going to have, you know, a bit of a bounce and people will be working and, and uh, we'll probably have a vaccine by then, but no one really knows for sure. And if, if this, if there's a recycle, if there's a second wave in the fall, mm. that's going to be very telling and you could have the opposite happening at the stock market. You could have a, Oh yes. I, I do feel like a second wave is all bets are off. Mm -hmm. uh, we got our results here, Soraya. Looks like uh, we have quite a good chunk of people voting already. Mm -hmm. Look at these. Uh, look at these results. Thirty percent. So that's uh -huh. kind of in that 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 range. It's lower. Mm -hmm. So we have more people gainfully employed uh, in this subset in this uh, this particular demographic 
group. Uh, so that's good news. Either, you know, your income situation is getting better uh, or you weren't, uh, you know, um, a threat to lose your job at yeah. since, uh, since March. Interesting to see. I know it's a small number, but what's that, Soraya? Whether people go out and spend that money. Well, isn't that right? Or what they spend it on. A lot of people have been putting their stimulus checks into rent, which uh, is not exactly what the administration was hoping for when it comes to creating growth, but we need to keep our homes. Interesting to see 5% on there. I know it's a small number, but 5% uh, were unsure, Soraya. There are a lot of people who don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. This is... When it comes to your job, right? Uncertainty. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. That kind of uncertainty can do economic damage on its own, can it, David? Absolutely. You know, we, we look at the undecided number for, 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 for uh, questions like this, and it does tell us a lot. And again, it goes back to that thread of angst, that thread of, it, of, of uh, stress that this poll is picking up because people are not only now worrying about their health and, and, and social distancing, but now the, the economy and whether or not, um, even if they come back to work, whether or not their regular income, because that was the wording of the question, their regular income will be at or above the level it was in February. Soraya, thanks for being part of our second panel here, WGBH Radio's Soraya Wintersmith, uh, who not only covers the issues we've been talking about, but uh, does a lot of work with electoral politics and will be uh, doing a lot of reporting leading up to the primary in uh, September and, of course, the general in November. It's good to see you, Soraya. Again, as I said to Bob, I don't remember the last time I saw any of you in person. So stay safe and thank you for contributing uh, as we walk through the new normal. If you're just joining us, my name is Joe Matthew. I'm the host of Morning Edition on WGBH, and we're spending time here with David Paleologos, who's crunched an enormous amount of polling data, and we're kind of picking apart these polls to look at some of the different issues that are part of our new normal, coronavirus polling and policy considerations, or we're going to get political now. Uh, this is actually a very important part of the program uh, and one that I've been looking forward to as a big political wonk uh, to bring in uh, one of the best political analysts around. Public sentiment toward voting in September and November. Joining us for this portion is Rachel Cobb, Chair and Associate Professor, professor of Government at Suffolk University. And it's great to see you, Rachel. There are a few issues uh, that are more important now than mail-in ballots. Few issues more important. The president is going over time to fight this idea. He just addressed this again in the Oval Office during a pool spray today, saying that mail-in ballots guarantee a fraudulent election. He said that we would be the laughing stock of the world if we allowed it to happen. A lot of people say it has to happen. That's absolutely right. Uh, a lot of people say it has to happen. In fact, according to a poll, that we did, 74% uh, of Massachusetts residents believe that uh, an election should be vote entirely by mail. Uh, we are seeing these statistics across the country in national polls as well. This is a crisis uh, and it is a crisis of both election administration and it is also a crisis of our democracy because we cannot have it be that people have to make a selection between whether they're going to put their health at risk or whether they're going to actually engage in our democratic process. And the message from the White House right now is saying that one of the methods that we have of voting that is not going to cause great and massive voter fraud. 25% of people voted by mail in 2016 and in 2014. I'm sorry, and in 2018. Uh, we have five states that have all vote by mail. There is a solid method of doing this where we can track the ballots using a barcode. There are safe ways to manage these elections. But what we're up against right now in this election is a poll worker base that is dramatically older. And those people are not going to want to work on election day. But also think about the other issues that are involved here, where we hold our polls, our polling locations. We have them at schools. We have them in 
in senior housing complexes. We have them in tight libraries where there's barely any room. We have them in a lot of places where we absolutely cannot practice social distancing. So the fewer uh, options that we have, the more dangerous it becomes. How scared are people uh, to the extent that we've learned through Suffolk's polling to vote, to wait in line? We saw some states have uh, special elections over the last couple of months where people were in some cases six feet apart and sometimes not, uh, and, in, and in many cases could have really been putting their lives in danger by simply voting. And in fact, they did. So one of the most recent studies done by the National Bureau of Economic Research found that in the counties in the Wisconsin primary that had more in-person voting, two weeks later, the incidence of COVID went up versus the places that had more vote by mail. So that's an indicator that this was a real issue in causing spread, and that is not what we wanna have happen. So yes, people are very anxious. They're very anxious about voting, and they're very anxious about our democracy. And, they, and as we can see in other polls, they don't feel that government is doing enough. If they are engaged enough to feel that way, they want to engage in this democracy to urge their leaders to do more. But the only way that we have to do that is through participation. So David, imagine that Wisconsin scenario on a national scale. Uh, we have a major problem here. What is it do we think that President Trump is taking a side on here? Why is this partisan mail-in or, or not to mail in the ballots? Because the more people vote, the worse off it is for a Republican nominee. We know Suffolk University is one of the only schools in the country that's done non-voter research, i.e. people who are either not registered or they're registered and they're, they're not planning to vote. And the non-voters are disproportionately made up of young, minority, and disabled people. Yeah. And those are people who could vote with a mail-in uh, ballot and who would devastate any Republican nominee for president or for U.S. Senate and maybe even Congress. So I think the Republican Party has to look at the statistics and try and rationalize that there's somehow this major corruption um, that would happen as a result of mail and, and ballots. But, you know, it's not justified in terms of the examples that Rachel has set forward. And ironically, in the Massachusetts poll, older people supported mail-in voting. It wasn't by 74%, it was slightly less. So a few more older people wanted to vote in person. But I think part of that is due to the Republican pushback in Massachusetts, where only 14% of those people who identify with the Republican Party want uh, mail-in voting. So it's a deeply divided partisan issue, unlike a lot, unlike transportation and and. Mm. You know, attending activities and sporting events. It's fascinating. So when we see President Trump become very passionate about this, get angry about this, we know Rachel Cobb, it's because he thinks he may well lose if we are voting by mail. That's absolutely right. And actually, there's a slide that we have about age and voting. And I just want to highlight um, this very issue. So here's a Fox News poll um, showing that that slightly different wording of this question. But you can see that still 63% of all citizens uh, uh, think that we should be able to vote by mail and 60% of independents. So I think those two numbers are really key here. Um, but if you look at who votes in the United States, uh, we see, so this is a chart that shows by age cohort who votes. The blue line at the bottom is 18 to 29 year olds, and the purple line at the top is over 60 year olds. And what you see is that even when there are increases in the number of people who voted, which certainly happened in the 2018 midterms, um, compared to other uh, midterm elections, you can see a dramatic increase between 2014 and 2018. Still, the, 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 uh, the percentage of people voting by age level is very different. So young people vote a lot at, at a lower rate than older people vote at it. 
So it's no wonder, actually, not surprising that older people who have voted for a long time and who feel comfortable with it would feel quite comfortable voting by mail uh, because they are aware that there is absentee voting. They are aware uh, and, and perhaps have participated in that themselves. So they are aware of, of the voting process and the intricacies of it in a way that young people, especially people who have never voted before, are not. And so their comfort level will be different. That being said, there is some research that's just come out that sh has shown that in states that have vote by mail, young people are very comfortable doing that. But one of the things that I want to emphasize is that when we change a policy, it is, a, it is confusing. And even though this, there's high demand for this, the ability for us to engage in a new way of doing things will require a lot of information and good information and sincere information and real information um, that will help people to navigate this new policy terrain. Rachel, we've been talking nationally uh, uh, to a large degree. How about the primary in September in Massachusetts? What do we know about people's uh, wherewithal, interest in voting by mail, and what will actually take place here? Well, what we know is that there is a competitive uh, Senate primary in Massachusetts, and that the primary will be on September 1st, and that this will at least in Boston. I'm actually not sure and across the state, but the schools in Boston will be closed that day. Um, so that means that uh, people will have will will be voting in September, and you know a lot of people are saying, well, we should just vote in tents, but we have no idea <laughs> whether that's possible. So one of the things that that uh, some of the recent um, proposed legislation in Massachusetts has suggested is that we should have uh, expanded early voting and some possibilities in some places where it's possible to have kind of drive by voting. It's it is necessary to have some polling places open on election day, precisely because this is a new policy. And so to the extent that we can encourage vote by mail, we need to, uh, but at the same time, we also need to be set up and have this apparatus. But think about the kinds of things that go into voting on election day, you know, the, the kinds of equipment that we need to use. We have to use pens <laughs> to fill in our ballots. Yeah. Um, those need to be sanitized. We go into a voting booth um, where there's a surface that other people have touched. Um, there is, if we are disabled or if we need to hear something in another language, um, we can use the automark machine, but that requires putting headphones on. It requires getting very close to something that somebody else has uh, recently touched. So there's a lot of um, details of managing those kinds of election day experiences that are that is uh, requires a lot of planning. That's a lot to consider. So, David Paleologos, you'd think that if uh, this happened anywhere, it would be in Massachusetts, no? I mean, we haven't had any cases in Massachusetts of massive voter fraud like uh, like the president is talking about. I mean, some states have had issues. Of course, everybody remembers the Florida hanging chads and and uh, the butterfly ballot and all of that. So we've been pretty lucky. You know, it's an interesting um, juxtaposition of of power versus change and 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 all the rest. I mean, the the ACLU, for example, uh, the the uh, NAACP, they they don't want an all mail-in uh, election because there's a there's a it disproportionately hurts particular demographics. So you, as Rachel says, you have to have some in-person voting, but it gets complicated. And and you know you've you've got to weigh the medical issues. We have no idea whether there'll be a flare-up, but you know poll workers, as Rachel said, you know many of them are older, uh, and they don't want to be trained to put on gloves and you know, wear masks and, and all the kind of uh, important, uh, the checklist of things that have to happen at every poll location to protect everybody's safety. So, um, you know, it's good. It's right now they haven't expanded it, but as, as, as we all know, there are pieces of legislation out there that, uh, you know, would, would hopefully open up the, the, the valve of, of people voting. So let's do our third poll question. This, uh, this involves you, this is everybody here. And it is of course about mail-in voting. Do you support or oppose these alternatives to in-person voting on election day? It's a multiple choice. And uh, Rachel, we've got quite a few to pick from here and they include early in-person voting, which is another part of this. Mm -hmm. 
Right, so early in-person voting is where uh, you don't actually need to have all of the precincts open for early in-person voting. It can happen at more centralized locations such as a city hall. Mm -hmm. And it's open during the week and on the weekends um, in the weeks preceding the election. The longer you have, presumably, the fewer people you will have on any given day and the more you'll be able to avoid lines. So expanding that period of time has some substantial benefits. Online voting is uh, something that seems to have gained some amount of popularity recently. I um, am uh, strenuously nervous about that one. Uh, I don't think this is the time to engage in technology testing. Uh, when the, so much of what we're dealing with right now is about the legitimacy of our elections. I think that would throw it up in the air. Is it worth doing a little myth busting here? The president in the said in the Oval Office, sitting behind the resolute desk today, that because of kids stealing ballots from mailboxes, that would be reason enough. Uh, and of course, he talked about harvesting as a major issue. He said every time there's been mail in voting, there has been fraud, which is not true. Uh, there have been uh, very few incidents of fraud, of voter fraud, period. And uh, I mean, very few <laughs> minuscule amounts of it. When it happens, it's caught. Uh, and so this is, uh, and I mean, were it that children were <laughs> running to mailboxes, dying to vote, that would make the uh, Democratic soul and <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but, you know, as we can see, our young people are not engaging in our democratic process as much as our older people. So, um, so the, 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 the opportunity for, and I joked before, you know, do kids even know what a mailbox is right now? <laughs> uh, so, so I can see the results of our uh, poll now that um, 95 percent of folks here per, um, would support mail-in voting. Uh, and quite a competition though between these, isn't there? 95% <laughs> mail-in voting, 87% absentee, 84 early, 35% online. You know, it does, the, the early in person actually doesn't surprise me because I think we might imagine that as being actually similar to a shopping experience. If it's something that you could do relatively quickly, go in, do it, and be able to leave in, a, in the way that we're not doing that on election day because there, there are lines and we have to wait our turn. That, that may explain some of that. All roads lead to shopping tonight, David. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, a lot of the small towns could coordinate it uh, very easily with with texting now, you know, where you could text into the town clerk and have a specific time, and people would minimally cross paths. and And like Rachel says, you you go in, sterilized pen, you cast your ballot, you leave, and you're you're done. Well, we'd love to be able to bring in uh, some of the questions that everyone has asked. Rachel, thank you for answering all these. Uh, questions that I've been throwing at you about every form of voting. Um, we've got a lot to figure out here too. That's really been the theme. Are we going to bring everyone in? I, it looks like that uh, we might do that, which would be great. But we've heard from uh, a number of you, and I'm going to start with uh, a Suffolk student by the name of Rachel. She's in Utah. Wanted to share this Republican state has had mail-in ballots for years. I wonder how these statements from President Trump will affect his very strong base out here in Utah and whether it will turn them off to vote by mail, Rachel. Yeah, that's a great question. And hello to Rachel, who I know. Uh, I have wondered the exact same thing. And so I'd actually uh, want to get from you what you're hearing on the ground um, from your fellow Utahns at the moment about this. Um, I would imagine that it's not making them very happy. Um, and, you know, there. The, one of the other things that we know about policies in general is that when people are happy with their policy, which people um, who do mail vote by mail, I mean, they, the people who do it are extremely happy about them having done it, and they talk about their um, their 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 vote by mail parties and filling out their ballots together and having a nice time that it builds community. Uh, so I would imagine that this is um, uh, making them quite upset. Yeah. 
question from Adam, uh, and this is something you might be able to help us with, Bob C. If people are asked to come back to work, but they're not comfortable taking the tea, and David's already established that that's a pretty big number of people uh, based on the uh, Suffolk poll, what steps can we take to get ready for many more cars on the road? Bob, is that mm. just going back to the old normal? That's what uh, that's what people are afraid of, and uh, as you can see from the photo behind me, it's happening. Um, these cars were at least not stopped. Apparently, they were moving, but uh, getting to that point once again, people say that the biggest reason they like telecommuting is not having to do their usual commute which for many people was a soul deadening one to two hours a day, which took a lot out of their lives. And that's why I think telecommuting is going to be a more attractive option for people and may help alleviate some of the traffic that is expected. At the same time, the T, its biggest challenge is to provide enough service to avoid overcrowding. They did talk today about a new technology that they're going to be introducing. I have a, a feeling it may be some kind of iPhone app, smartphone app that will let people know in real time how crowded the bus is, how crowded the subway is, uh, and perhaps uh, give them more confidence about when they can more safely travel. But the T is going to be experimenting with a lot of things to try to get people back on public transit but not too many at once. So employers are also going to be playing a big role. And as the governor announced the other day, he has you know, major companies agreeing with him to try to keep people at home as long as possible uh, to mitigate that. And we're just going to have to see as the weeks go on uh, how successful that effort is. I love the sound of the app, but I'll tell you what, if, I mean, I'm thinking about the countdown clocks not even working on the platforms, <laughs> Bob. We're like going the speed of sound now, but I guess Something you have to do it at some it, point. Right? Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> they're trying. The They're also going to be introducing front door boarding again on buses and begin oh. collecting fares when phase two begins, earliest would be June 8th. But the idea is to get people going into the bus in the front and leaving in the back. Mm -hmm. which would uh, eliminate a lot of the cross traffic that takes place. But it's the crowding aspect of it that really keeps people away from, from jumping back on the T again, I think. Hey, Saria Wintersmith, you might appreciate the question from William. Uh, one idea that's been floated around during the pandemic has been that the new normal may be fewer people moving to or living in major metro areas with cities becoming in, in some cases, you know, major uh, zones of contagion. Uh, what are your thoughts on the potential of the, the city becoming a shell of its former self? What might that mean for Boston? I think WGBH has done a couple of stories about folks just realizing that they can telecommute and hankering to get out further and further away. Um, as a city dweller, I think it's pretty sad because it's a fun place to play. I yeah. would that there would be a vaccine and we could all return to huh. going out to restaurants and things, but. That'll be our next forum, the vaccine, the race to the vaccine. <laughs> hey, David, I wanted to ask you uh, something that it would probably be great for everybody to hear about uh, before uh, we say goodbye, certainly. And that's a question from Ari, and that's how many people uh, were pulled by David what were their aggregate ages? I just wonder if you could speak to the methodology a little bit. Yeah, sure. So for a national poll, we usually do a thousand respondents with USA Today. A thousand respondents is plus or minus three percentage points. So for any given result, you're going to add or subtract three percent from that. So it's pretty, it's pretty, um, pretty accurate in 95 percent of cases. In a statewide poll, we do 500 completes. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually plus or minus 4.4 percentage points. And so we basically divide the state, in the case of Massachusetts, to give you a quick primer, we divide the state into the 14 counties, we set quotas in each county, and we make sure that we have the correct apportionment of gender, age, race, political party affil affiliation, and then we group those counties into four baskets. So Suffolk County is its own basket, then we have Southeast Mass Cape, so that's Norfolk, Plymouth County, Bristol down to the Cape is one basket. We have Middlesex and Essex counties together is a third basket. And then anything from Worcester on west, the five counties in Western Mass, including Worcester, that's the final basket. Understood. I appreciate that. It's funny how savvy consumers are becoming about polling. And it's yes. it's something that we, we try to be transparent about. Um, 
How about a last one for Rachel Cobb? And that has to do with uh, voting by mail. What impact would a system like that have on exit polls, Rachel, and having ballots being counted on time? Would we be waiting around for days to know who won? That is a great question. I, I'll take the second one first, which is regarding um, the days to count. And yeah, yeah. It, it will extend it. I think one of the things that um, we've all learned in this is that patience is a virtue. And uh, we're going to really need to put some patience. I, don't, I think we cannot expect to know the answer to the presidential election necessarily on election night, given the numbers that we could be seeing and counting. And you know, there are some details to this, which I won't get into, but the bottom line is we're going to wait for those ballots to get in. If the postmark date, if we're, we're um, allowing things to be postmarked on election day and after, and if a substantial number come in. And then also when people are actually using the voting machines to count um, the ballots themselves and whether that will extend. So I, th I think we will need to wait. With regard to exit polling, I, I throw it back to my awesome colleague, Dave, to tell me this. I think my bet is that there can be some, some phone uh, exit polling that can be done um, to get some results for that. Absolutely, you know, um, exit polls have not gotten a good, uh, uh, they've gotten a bad rap lately. Um, uh, you know, missing, you know, and, and with the multiple waves of exit polls, they correct themselves, but by, you know, two in the morning, they have it right. And, but a lot of times the early exit polls throw off the, the broadcasters from the major networks because they, you know, they think a trend is happening and then it ends up being reversed. Mm -hmm. uh, it just reminds me of why we've developed the bellwether model at Suffolk University, which is a great opportunity for us to find particular areas in a state um, that accurately reflect the outcome in that state, whether it be a ward, a precinct, a county, um, a parish in the case of Louisiana. And that's really helpful to give us an added tool to help uh, make, make, uh, make a prediction a little bit better. I'll tell you, it's hard to believe. Uh, we're walking into June here. This election is gonna sneak up on us like we don't even know because we have been so obsessed with one story for so long. Uh, thanks to everyone for helping us answer questions from our participants. We have one more poll, and this is we're going to we're going to wrap this uh, this whole forum here, and it has to do with Governor Baker. Uh, your opinion of Governor Baker's plans? It's another uh, pretty basic, multiple choice: approve, disapprove, no opinion. Your feelings on Governor Baker's statewide reopening plan? Uh, I'll tell you, it, this phased approach, David, is one that has come with a lot of criticism from both sides. And some might suggest that that's when you know you're doing something right. Exactly. You know, and it's a snapshot in time. So the Baker approval can change. But what we've noticed is that he's been consistently high, even among Democrats and independents. And there's a swath of Republicans, Trump, of those people who are Trump Republicans in Massachusetts, it, they're not a majority, obviously, but they're very anti-Baker. Um, the the, the hardline pro-business conservatives and the Trump Republicans. So we've actually seen a dip in some Republicans' view of Charlie Baker um, in the polling. And uh, that's very consistent, whether you're polling residents or voters or likely voters. Um, but through it all, Baker has, has been pretty popular. Yeah. And the results. I guess that's about in line with what you'd expect, David. Sure. Sure, high, high, high uh, number of no opinions there, which I found interesting, but you know, almost 70%. And we know that the 80% number that we have for Charlie Baker in the residence poll would be a little bit lower because likely voters and um, registered voters um, might be a little bit more conservative in, you know, when you compare the two subgroups. So I think that 68% is probably in the right ballpark. I think the real number is in the low 70s. And that's something. Well, what a fascinating conversation. I want to thank everybody for spending some time with us today. Uh, I hope you learned as much as I did. And I'd like to thank everyone, beginning with our panelists, David Paleologos, Rachel Cobb, Soraya Wintersmith, and Bob C. A special note of thanks to our producers and to Susan Spurlock and everyone at the Ford Hall Forum and Suffolk University. For everyone at WGBH News, I'm Joe Matthew. We'll see you next time on the